good afternoon to all the participant for the fifth afom webinar as you know due to the unprecedented situation because of the covid uh, the in person physical meetings could not be taken place and therefore since june we have started afom webinar uh, the webinars are being organized by the chair etc and also supported by the chair pdc and all other afom excom unfortunately because uh, jin was stuck up in his uh, official work he could not be here so again i am introducing you the uh, fifth webinar of the afom today uh, we have uh, the speaker uh, dr chai hong yong from malaysia and he is also chair of uh, the professional development committee and uh, she will be talking about the nuclear medicine requirement all to moderate this uh, session we have uh, jaya singam from uh, jay jaya singam from uh, colombo university he is a senior lecturer in uh, nuclear physics and uh, medical physicist working very hard and also the member of the science committee this uh, uh, webinar is getting recorded if you have any question you can put your question into the question chat box the uh, moderator will collect the questions and he will put to the orator of today's uh, uh, webinar and we'll have a lively discussion this webinar is accredited and uh, this one hour webinar will fetch you two cme uh, cpd points for that you have to uh, write to the pdc chair or the link will provide in that thing further uh, we as you know very well that there's a 20th anniversary and on this 20th anniversary a lot of activities we are doing so please keep on visiting the afom website for the next year also we are planning to continue this webinar from january to june 6 month and the schedule will be soon available with this short introduction and welcome you all the participant the speaker the moderator i hand over the floor to the moderator today's moderator uh, j jaya from colombo sri lanka so this is your time dr j jaya okay thank you very much uh, professor arun chokle for your kind introduction so ladies and gentlemen so may i have your attention so good morning good afternoon uh, good evening so let me uh, leave to share my slides yeah the presentation in today webinar is about establishment of nuclear medicine facilities and radio power technical in nuclear medicine nu nuclear medicine so this is very important topics because of because nuclear medicine facilities are still under development in developing countries so nuclear medicine uses uh, uses a small amount of uh, quantity of radioisotope injected into the in, in your body to finding evaluate or treat a variety of diseases the patient the radiation dose is very low in nuclear medicine nuclear imaging compared to other uh, uh, imaging modality like uh, ct so like of uh, medical isotopes production facilities and its uh, short half life are limited the nuclear medicine services in the developing countries so this presentation will give you a give you an opportunity to learn about current status of nuclear medicine facilities and way to improve the current practice in your countries so uh, it my pleasure to begin this event by introducing professor dr chai hong yang she is the current she is currently an associate professor at the teller university malaysia in 2005 she obtained her bsc honors in uh, health physics from university of technology malaysia she received her masters in medical physics in 2007 from university of malay and she has obtained her phd in 2012 from university of malaysia malay the dr yang is a medical physicist and a certified radiation uh, certified 
radiation protection officer. She is one of the few medical physicists in Malaysia who complete the IAEA clinical train, training in diagnostic radiology. She has several additional responsibilities in international and local organization as well. Dr. Yang is currently chairing the professional relations committee of the AFAMBA and a web subcommittee of IOMP. She is also elected vice president of the Southeast Asian Federal of Organization of Medical Physics, CFOM, and the founder medical um, founder member of the Asian College of Medical Physics. So currently, Dr. Jiang is leading the non-communicable disease research cluster at the uh, Taylor's University. She is also focusing research to other areas such as image-guided cancer treatment, 3D printing in medicine, radio, radio mix, and as well as radiation protection and optimization. She has already won several local and international awards for her research works, including a certific certific uh, certified Certificate of Merit Award by the European Society of Radiology. She has received this in 2012. She was the first Malaysian to receive such a very high status award in history. Dr. Jiang has already published more than 50 peer review articles, two academic books, and she has written two book chapters. She currently the three patent uh, drive uh, from her research. Finally, she has been regularly invited to talk at many local and international uh, conferences. She also serves as a reviewer for several international journals. So now I'm going to uh, invite Dr. Chai Hong Yang to deliver her talk. The participants, so you can drop your questions in, in the chat box during the presentation, anytime during the presentation. So your questions will be taken by Dr. Jiang at the end of the presentation in the priority order. So please keep your mic in mute. So thank you very much for giving this opportunity. Now I uh, invite Dr. Uh, Jiang uh, to deliver her uh, lectures. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Jaya, for the very kind introduction. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Chai. I'm going to share my screen now. Let's see if it works. Do you see my screen now? Okay. Yes. Great. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, before I start, I also like to wish uh, those, sorry, uh, because today is the mid-autumn festival for in the lunar calendar. I wish uh, every, the, those who are celebrating a happy uh, mid-autumn festival. So uh, I'm from Malaysia. This is the topic of my presentation today, establishment of a nuclear medicine facility and radio pharmaceuticals in nuclear medicine. These are the contents. Uh, we'll briefly go through the history of nuclear medicine. I think history is very important to know uh, how we got to where we are and the current status of nuclear medicine, some development in radio pharmaceuticals, and the main topic is the establishment of a nuclear medicine facilities. Uh, I will go through some local and international guidelines as well, and emergency preparedness as well as uh, future development. So uh, most of the contents of my talks are acquired from these uh, resources, the IAA Human Health Campus, AAPM Task Group 108, NCRP, and the ICRP documentation. I also uh, have uh, adopted some contents from our local guidelines from our Ministry of Health. So let's go through the history of uh, nuclear medicine. So the history of nuclear medicine can be traced back to 1890s, where Henry Becquerel and Marie Curie first discovered uh, radioactivity. Henry Becquerel discovered the uranium and Marie Curie discovered radium and polonium. And polonium is named after her homeland. And in 1930, Ernest uh, Orlando Lawrence discovered the first, uh, developed the first uh, psychotron. And in 1937, Carlo Perea and Emilio Sicker, they discovered the methods of isolation for technician 99M. And later on in 1946, there was the first uh, radio iodine treatment for thyroid cancer by Dr. Southhurst. Dr. Southhurst is an American physician and he is now known as the founder of nuclear medicine and later on also we call him as the father of theranostics. In 1957, Hal O. Engel 
developed the first uh, gamma camera and it's named after his name, Anger Gamma Camera. And one year later, Walter Tucker, Margaret Green and the Pova Richards, they developed the Technician 99 amp generator. And in 19, uh, so with the combination of the gamma camera and the technetium uh, generator, it started the widespread use of nuclear medicine. In 1973, Michael Ter uh, Pogosian, Michael Fraps, and Edward Hoffman developed the first uh, PET scanner. So, uh, um, I'm trying to use my laser pointer, if you can. Do you see my mouse movement? Yes. You can see my mouse movement, is it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, that's great, that's great. Okay, so uh, what about the development in radio pharmaceuticals? So as mentioned earlier, in 1930, we have the first psychotron. So it can be used to produce uh, carbon 11, 418, which is used for PET-CT scan, gallium 67, and so on. 1940, we have the first reactor. Uh, this is to produce carbon-14, phosphorus, and so on, as well as the molytonin 99, which is the mother source for technetium. In 1950, we have the first automated scanner for thyroid gland and also the uh, angle gamma camera as well as the technetium generator. And in 1960, it was the gallium 67 being first introduced for soft tissue tumor imaging. And this is very useful for lymphoma, lung cancer, and brain tumors imaging. In 1970, we had a uh, thallium 201 for heart scan. And also during this time was the first uh, PET scanner prototype developed. And later on, we used 418 for glucose metabolism in human brain imaging. 1980, we have IOD-131 MIBG for diagnosis and treatment of childhood cancer, as well as technetium 99 MEB for myocardial perfusion scan. In 1990, we have MicroPET, but this one mainly used for uh, preclinical imaging as well as research. We had a Renium 188 generator for bone pain uh, treatment, as well as uh, starting the broader application for the therapy nuclear medicine by using radionuclides, uh, which are mostly beta or alpha emitters. We also have, I'm sorry, <laughs> the timing is out. Okay, uh, we also have radio label antibodies as well as uh, starting of the alpha particle therapy. And in 2000, uh, in the last decade, we have seen the very uh, rapid development in radio immunotherapy Theranostics, as well as uh, molecular imaging and therapy. So what about in the next decade? What you think? So th uh, this is just my personal view. Uh, these are all the active areas in research currently. And I would think that the coming decade, we will be more focusing on personalized dosimetry, the treatment planning software, as well as uh, artificial intelligence. So the application of nuclear medicine can be generally divided into four areas. First one is the non-imaging studies. That includes the thyroid probe that we use for uh, thyroid uptake studies. And also the gamma camera or the radio immunoassay is a very effective method uh, for the detection of some biomarkers. Then we have diagnostic uh, imaging, which can be further divided into planar imaging or spec imaging. Then we have hybrid machine, the SPECT, followed by PET-CT, PET-MR, and now we have even uh, SPEC, PET, and CT hybrid. <laughs> and in nuclear medicine therapy, so, uh, it can be divided into targeted radionuclide therapy, radio immunotherapy, and selective internal radiation therapy. And the more recently is the Theranostics. Theranostics is a combination of therapy and diagnostic application. And this is an approach towards the personalized medicine. So in summary, the development of nuclear medicine rely on the three key factors. First one is the production of radionuclides. They include the nuclear reactor, the particle accelerators, as well as the generators. Second is the chemical process to synthesize the radiopharmaceutical for imaging and treatment. And lastly is the instruments, which is the camera that can detect radiation emitted from the body. And these are the current technology, started from gamma camera. Then we have spec camera. Uh, basically, these two are the same, except the imaging technique is different. Then we have spec SCT as well as spec CT. And also, we also have dedicated uh, spec scanner, such as the cardiac spec. 
and we have PET CT, and the more recent one is the PET MR. And these are uh, the latest development. Uh, I'm not sure you have seen the machine or not, but uh, some of them are already in the market. Some are still under the studies. The first one is the S-Flex. S-Flex is uh, the camera head can be positioned at, uh, freely for flexible imaging, especially useful for patients who cannot move on the table. And we have brand spec, which can give an uh, image resolution of two millimeters. And then uh, this one is interesting. This is additive specificity and the detector head can actually go in and out automatically, follow the, the size of the patient. And the last one is the spec CT PET uh, hybrid camera uh, by any scan. Uh, in terms of radio uh, nucleoid availability, I would like to show you this uh, very interesting image pictures uh, from Blobber. Uh, it's called a nuclear chocolate box. <laughs> The periodic table of nuclear medicine is a very nice um, representation of the radionuclides that are currently in use in nuclear medicine. So I just give a few examples here, like rubidio 82 used for a uh, cardiac scan. Technician 99M is here. Samaria 153, uh, Forin 18, Lutetium 177 for teranostic. And there is polonium uh, 210 and you can see a skeleton there because uh, there was an incident of radioactive poisoning uh, using polonium about 10 years ago. So uh, I'm sorry for the low resolution image but if you're interested you can write to the author to get a more uh, clear image. So uh, this is the main topic of my talk today. Uh, to establish a nuclear medicine department we need to do a very thorough uh, planning. So it should include all these components, these five components. First is the organization and the management structures. Second is the very detailed SOP documentation on the clinical services. SOP on the use of radiopharmaceuticals. SOP on radiation safety and security, as well as the site and the architectural design. I'll go through it one by one in my coming talk. So let's start with the organization uh, structures. Starting from the head of department, assisted by the administrative uh, staff, and the service can be divided into two. One is the clinical services, one is the medical support services. So under clinical services, we have nuclear medicine specialists. They are assisted by uh, medical officers, nuclear medicine technologists or radiographers, nuclear medicine staff nurse, as well as the attendants. Whereas under the supporting uh, services, there are nuclear radio pharmacists, uh, radio biochemists, as well as uh, nuclear physicists or medical physicists. So since uh, most of us here are medical physicists, so what, what is our role as a medical physicist in a nuclear medicine department? Uh, I have listed out the responsibilities here, but I will not go through it one by one. But in general, our responsibilities involve in radiation safety and not only for patients, also for the staff and the member of public, as well as in the development of the quality assurance program for the whole department. So we're responsible as a radiation protection supervisor or, and or the radiation waste management officer. We need to ensure the process of procurement of the radioactive items fulfill the legal requirements. We are responsible for the acceptance and storage of radioactive materials. We also need to monitor the radiative materials packaging, labeling, and the transportation. We are responsible for the cleanup and monitoring of radiative spills. And we need to ensure the decontamination activities are conducted according to the proper procedures. We need to monitor the supervised and control areas. And we need to monitor all the radiation workers' radiation dose record and also make sure they attend the required uh, periodic medical examination. We need to investigate uh, radiation exposure for any accident or contamination. We need to notify and report all the abnormal exposure to the relevant authority. And uh, we might also involve in the monitoring of patients undergoing therapy. And also we might involve in the planning of facilities, equipment, commissioning and decommissioning. Uh, we are responsible for the preparation of specification, acceptance test and the QC of the equipment. We provide first-line maintenance and help to identify and resolve the equipment problems in liaison with the services uh, personnel, such as the engineers. We also involve in management of uh, scientific and technical aspects of the services. We are responsible for the overall supervision uh, 
usually we are tasked uh, to help uh, to monitor the service for the computer system management to provide advice on computer use as well as the first line support for application in software. Uh, we can also involve ourselves uh, in providing the technical advice and assist in the quantification and dosimetric calculation. Okay, uh, lastly, we also need to participate in the teaching and training program as well as the CD, uh, CPD training, uh, is such as what we are doing now. And we also need to involve ourselves in R&D as necessary for the practice of nuclear medicine. And here I would like to highlight that the IAEA, that has a provide a very uh, excellent support to the developing countries in related to uh, nuclear services. So these are some uh, textbooks available in the IAA website. And basically most of the resources uh, available on the IAA website are free to be downloaded. So there is a nuclear medicine uh, physics handbook for teachers and students, as well as there is a clinical training of medical physicists specializing in nuclear medicine. This is uh, in parallel to the ROM as well as the DRMP training. And also if you are interested, there is a one section, one particular section just for medical physicists. And here should contain all the information uh, that is necessary for, uh, the med for a medical physicist to refer. And next, where to find resources? Uh, for example, here is a guideline uh, if you want to develop the establish a nuclear medicine facilities. So here are the resources. These are the international organizations who provide reliable information. The first one is the IEA Human Health Campus, European uh, Association of Nuclear Medicine, Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging uh, based in US, as well as uh, your own local policy and guidelines. And here I show this screenshot of the IEA uh, website. This uh, this is the IEA Nuclear Medicine QC Toolkit. IEA has been very generous uh, in sharing all their resources. And uh, unfortunately, I, I have seen like not many people aware that uh, actually here in the IEA website, there are some free videos okay, uh, for us if you want to have like uh, self-directed learning. And also they have a platform called Ample that we can get a lot of uh, online uh, teaching resources to help us to improve our uh, professional services. And in, in this case, uh, this uh, particular example is the uh, Nuclear Medicine QC Toolkit. So you can basically download it for free, for free and you can, uh, it's a ImageJ plugin. And you can use this software for the simplified uh, analysis steps when you are doing the QC for the Nuclear Medicine uh, machines. Okay, so next is the SOP on radiation safety and security. Uh, this is important, so I will uh, list it down here. So the document should include the radiation safety of staff, discharge of radioactive patients, and protection of general public. This includes uh, the guidelines for hospitalization with isolation. For example, iodine 131, if the administered dose more than 1,100 megabacterial, the patient has to be watered. And the guideline for discharge patient with restrictions as well as uh, discharge the patient without any restrictions. Use of proper transport by the discharge uh, radioactive patients. Managing death of the radioactive patients. Order, purchase, transportation and security of radioactive source. Radioactive waste management. And we also need to include the radiation accidents if in case of accidents, what should we do? This, uh, this will cover like maybe wrong radiopharmaceutical use, any therapeutic treatment delivered to the wrong patient or the wrong tissues. Or the patient is treated with a dose differed by 10% from the prescribed dose. Or any diagnostic uh, exposure more than 50% than the intended dose. And also in the document, in the SOP, we also need to include the possibility for major radiation incidents such as a uh, theft, loss, or sabotage of any radiation source, contamination on individual that required uh, medical treatment, and also for the contamination, which is more than five times of the annual limit intake. And management of radioactive spills, this can be divided into major spills and the minor spills. Major spills are the, the example of the 
radiation level is different for different types of radionuclides. For example, 10 millicurie of 418, 1 millicurie of iodine, 100 millicurie of technetium, and so on. We also need to include the management of radiation monitoring equipment failure. In case uh, of the breakdown, what should we do? And management of radiation hazards in a fire accident. So uh, next is the architectural design of the nuclear medicine department. So these are the key uh, components that we must consider. First is the space, the power, the floor loading concerns, as well as radiation shielding. Uh, the first one is uh, traffic patterns should be designed to keep the movement of the radiative source, including the radiative patients, away from the staff, unrelated patients or the member of public, and also the sensitive imaging equipment. The area shall be arranged in an increasing order from the low activity to high activity. And this is a must. The radiation symbols must be uh, displayed. This is an example of a typical nuclear medicine layout. Uh, this is, here is the entrance. So starting from the entrance, okay, this, here should be the uh, low activity area. And towards the end of the corridor, Okay, we can place, uh, we can arrange accordingly for the area of higher activities. And if, we, if the facility has a PET CT or a psychotron uh, facility, it can be extended towards the end here. And for the classification of area, we have control area and supervised area. For control areas, the example is the room for preparation of radiopharmaceuticals, room for dispensing, room for storage uh, of the radionuclide and the waste, room for administration of the radiopharmaceuticals and the imaging rooms are all classified under control areas. And supervised area, which is the whole department. So there is no clean area in nuclear medicine department. And next is the technical specification for shooting calculation. So uh, here I acquired, the, I referring to the guideline by the AAPN task group 108. This is a formula recommended by the task group. Okay, it looks very long and complicated, okay, but uh, don't worry, we'll go through it one by one. And these are the summary of the dose parameters you can read up. These are the definition and these are the formula. Okay, so the formula looks very complicated, uh, but uh, if we break it down one by one, okay, uh, we'll try to go through it together now. So uh, the first parameter is P. So P stands for the weekly dose limit. So here we assume uh, 50 working weeks per year. So for uncontrolled area, uh, we will apply the dose limit for the member of public, which is one millisievert per year. And we divide by 50 weeks, it would be 20 microsievert per week. So this would be the dose uh, level for the P. Whereas for the control area, uh, the occupational dose limit applied, which is 50 millisievert per year. And, but most shielding calculations use a target level of 5 millisievert per year okay, uh, to apply the RRR principle. So if 5 millisievert per year divided by 50, we will get 100 microsievert per week. So this is the P value here for the control areas. Next we have D. So D is the distance, distance from the source. So for example here, this is a PET uh, uptake room or the scanning room. We assume the patient is uh, sitting one meter above the floor. And for the officers above the floor, we assume that the officers are sitting 0.5 meter from the floor. Okay, and for the room below, we assume the standard height of a person is 1.7 meters. And for the room next to it, uh, we assume the person is uh, standing 0.3 meter away from the wall. So these are the distance that uh, we need to apply in this, in this formula. Okay, next is the uh, tau. This is a tau. This is a dose rate constant or sometimes we call it as gamma constant. So the unit is micro silver meter square per mega per hour. And we can refer to the task group, APN task group, they are given us these uh, tables that we can refer these uh, numbers. And for technetium is this one, 
and the iodine is this one. Next is the T. T is the occupancy factor. So for all the control area, the occupancy factor is one. For the adjacent uh, treatment room, patient examination room is half. For corridor, employee lounge, uh, and the staff restroom is one fifth. And for the treatment wall door is one eighth, and so on. So this table is also available uh, from the NCRP 147. Then uh, we have these parameters. So NW is the number of patients per week. So here we assume eight patients a day five days a week, so there would be 40 patients per week. A0 is the initial injector activity. So let's take the example of PET CT. The A0 is typically 555 megabacterial or 50 millicurry. And the T is the time. If it's in the uptake room, then the uptake time is 60 minutes. If it's in the PET scanning room, then the acquisition time we assume is 45 minutes. And from here, based on the time, we will apply the dose reduction factors because of the decay of the radiative source. So for example, this is the table, uh, the RT value for foreign 18. So let's say we are... Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, yes, now, you, now we can. Okay, great. Okay, so, uh, so we have gone through all the parameters just now, one by one. Okay, and lastly, we will get this B value. B stands for transmission factors, and the table is also provided, table four in the AAPN task group. And by referring the value here, we can find the thickness required for the shielding. And we have to pay attention for the thickness here. If you are using lead, the unit is in millimeter. If concrete or iron, the unit is centimeters. So we have, we have done the formula just now, the complicated formula just now, okay? And this is the example how we do the calculation. So let's take the uptake room. Uh, so at uptake room, uh, we want to achieve a protection goal of about 20 microsilver per week. The distance based on measurement is four meter. Gamma constant, we can refer to the table just now. Occupancy factor is one. Number of patients is 40. Injector activity, we assume, is uh, 555 megabacterial. Decay factor is one. The source duration in the uptake room is uh, 60 minutes. And hence, the reduction factor is 0 0.831. So the reduction factor is getting from the table just now. And from here, we have all the parameters and we will get the B value. So the B value is 0 0.188. And by referring back to the... Oh. Sorry, I think my slide is gone, is it? Yes, yes. Sir. Yeah, slide has gone. Again, you have to okay. write, uh, share it again and come to that thing. All right. Do you see my screen now? Yes, yes. Okay, so I need to go to... Ouch. Sorry for the technical error. Okay, so we were here just now for the uptake room. So we get the B value is 0.188 and we refer to the table, this table. So 0.188 is here, right? here, uh, if this is the LED, apply for LED, so the thickness that required is 12 millimeters. Okay, so therefore, the answer is uh, 12 millimeters or 1.2 centimeter of plumbum is required, or that equivalent to 15.2 centimeter of concrete. Okay, uh, the next example is for the scanning room, the PET CT scanning room. 
uh, again, it's the same calculations, except the reduction factor is different because the time is different. For, for, so for scanning room, we are using uh, 45 minutes, and in the end, we will get the B value of 0 0.334, and that requires a shielding of 0.8 centimeter of plumbum or 11 centimeter of concrete. Okay, so um, that, that is all about the formula for the calculation of shielding. And it's very much encouraged uh, to use computer software. For example, Excel can actually do the work uh, for all the calculations because we need to calculate for every individual area. And we need to calculate for all the walls as well as the floor and the ceiling uh, shielding. And this is an example of the report that we need to submit for the shielding uh, requirements so we need to have an engineering drawing and we also we can use the color coding for the different shielding requirements and of course uh, there are also commercial software available and this company this software is called rsd and by the company name called 511kev they are based in uh, australia so by using the software, uh, do you hear me? I heard some yeah. noise. Just yeah, sure. yeah. All right. So uh, this software can do a great job by just uh, keying a few numbers. Okay. So uh, you can see the you, you can choose the scenario. Okay. Lesson. This one only the city is used without the pet. So this will be the dose map. And if there are pet uh, patient inside the department, and this will be the dose map in the department. Okay, so uh, this is the conclusion, the summary for the shooting calculation. So uh, we have to make a few assumptions. And the calculation method actually is based on the most uh, conservative approach, meaning that we are using the maximum dose uh, possible for the calculation. And in fact, the gantry of the scanner can provide substantial uh, dose reduction, okay, because uh, they are shielding that. But because uh, we are taking the most conservative uh, approach, we don't consider that in our calculation. And for most uh, of the new facilities, they can use a concrete as the shielding material because concrete is cheaper. However, for the existing facilities, uh, often we have to use lead, sorry, because of the space constraint. And for uncontrolled area with high occupancy should be located as far as possible from the uptake room and the imaging rooms. Separate toilets uh, should be located for the pet patients close to the imaging room. If the uncontrolled area are located above and below the uptake and imaging room, the spacing between the floor may need to be greater than the normal. But if that is not feasible, then the floor need to be able to bear the weight of the lead shielding. So uh, because of the requirement of shielding, uh, most of the nuclear medicine departments are located at the ground floor. So if it's at the ground floor, then you can save the cost for the floor shielding. This is an example of a, uh, it's a good uh, design of a nuclear medicine department layout. So this is the entrance of the patient. So here would be the law activity area and towards the end of the corridor will be the higher activity. And uh, in the last end of the corridor is the patient toilet. Sometimes we call it as a hot toilet, uh, but this one only reserved for the pet patient, the pet city patient. So the patients, uh, once they've done the imaging, the PET CT scan, they will use this toilet okay, to pass urine before they uh, go out from the department. And portable shielding. So we, during the planning as well, the design as well, we need to consider okay, to buy uh, additional portable shielding. Okay, this includes the lead containers as well as the shielding uh, lead bricks just in case of any emergency. And also from the pet city uptake room, the FDG uptake room, if there is a constraint of uh, space, 
let's say uh, we cannot have an individual room for every individual patient, then it is also possible that we can apply the portable shielding in between the patients. And for surfaces, all the floors, the work surface, and the wall should be should have hard washable, non-porous, and leak-proof covering to allow for easy decontamination and no carpet is advised. And for ventilation, uh, we need to consider the ventilation as well, especially for the hot lab. It should be a unidirectional airflow from low activity to higher activity area. So in such, in the hot lab, we will apply a negative pressure, meaning that the air is always flowing from outside to inside. For blumping, it shall be planned to ensure direct flow of possible radioactive liquid influence directly to the decay tank or to the ultimate discharge point. The drain pipes and the decay tank should be leak-proof and corrosion resistant. And for the radionuclide therapy area, it is advised to separate them from the diagnostic area and have a separate access where possible. The radiation level at the nurse station in the ward and outside of the isolation room shall not exceed one microsievert per hour. How we get this number it is based on the dose limit for the member of public, which is one millisievert per year. And we should consider for a design for the in-house uh, radio pharmacy hot lab. And also uh, we should have extra space for radioactive storage in the future. And also the radioactive waste disposal and the management shall comply with the radiation protection guidelines and the regulations. Okay, uh, this is the shielding requirement uh, for different facilities. So it's very much depending on what are the radionuclides that are being used. For example, if the departments uh, only have the spec facilities without the PET facilities, and most of the time we are using technician 99M. Technician 99M, the, energy, the gamma energy is 140 keV and the HVL of lead is 0.3 mm. The 10 value layer is 0.8 mm. And this requires about 2 mm of plumbum for the shielding, as well as for the syringe, the syringe shield. And for technician 99M, uh, because 2 mm of lead, uh, even though it contributes to the weight, but it's still possible to do the direct injection. However, if we are designing for a PET facilities, PET CT facilities, then uh, 418 is applied. The energy is 511 keV, which is very much higher than the technicium. And the HVL is 6 mm. So we need, uh, typically we need 5 cm of lead. Okay, for the, the hot lab uh, workbench. For the shielding for the syringe, typically we use about one centimeter of lead. So because of this one centimeter, it is like too heavy okay, to be administered, to be handling. So usually for PET CT uh, injection, for the 4018 injections, we will set up the line, the catheter line, and do the IV injection through the catheter line. Okay, whereas for beta source, such as uh, Ethereum 90, Ethereum 90 is a pure beta uh, emitter. It only emits beta, no gamma radiation. Uh, we need to pay extra uh, consideration actually for beta source because um, if we use the wrong shielding materials, the beta particles will interact with the high Z material, for example, the lead, and it will generate brain star lung S3. So uh, this is according to the principles of the particles interaction with metal. So when the electron go through a very high uh, atomic numbers of atom, it will actually deflect it and it will generate the brain star lung S3. So if you use a wrong uh, shielding material for the beta source, okay, instead of giving protections, we are actually adding more hazards, more uh, radiation hazards to the department. So for beta source, the recommended material is a PMMA or plastic of about one centimeter. Okay, and for the iodine one three one, the what uh, shielding? So iodine one three one is uh, considered as the highest uh, energy radiative source uh, that is being used in nuclear medicine therapy. 
it emits both uh, beta and gamma radiation. The beta is 600 uh, keV, the gamma is 364 keV, and the HVL is 0.3 cm, TVL is 1.1 cm. So for the isolation watt, uh, because uh, we have to, sometimes uh, we'll administer uh, the radio iodine pill to the patients uh, in the watt. So we might need to transfer the source from the nuclear medicine department to the isolation watt. So we need a portable uh, cut with proper shielding for the iodine source. And also in the isolation room, uh, it's advisable to put the uh, non absorbent layer, the plastic layer on the floor, okay, under the bed and also inside the toilet to, so that the, if in case of any contamination, it can be easily cleaned up. And also for the lead shielding, the lead apron, uh, the usual, the normal lead apron, the thickness is about 0.35 millimeters to 0.5 millimeters, and that is actually not sufficient to be used for iodine uh, 131 shielding. So additional uh, protection is needed, such as the portable lead shielding like this. So in case of the staff uh, need to go in to check on the patients, the staff can actually stand behind the shielding. Uh, next, I will touch a little bit about Psychotron. So this is a layout of a Psychotron uh, facilities. So in case uh, if the departments uh, need to install a Psychotron, so it will be placed at the end of the corridor, but next to the pet city room. Okay, and next to the psychotron, they need to be uh, attached a radiochemistry lab and also the QC and the dispensing room. As of 2018, there are over 1,200 psychotrons around the world and approximately 550 of them uh, operate above 16 mega electron volts and this is actually sufficient to produce technician 99M. As we all know that technician 99 m is uh, produced using the molytonin generator, but currently uh, it was happening in 2009 and also 2012 and 2013 uh, of the world, the whole, the global uh, shortage of the molytonin generator. So, and then the scientists have actually uh, developed a method using psychotron to produce technician 99 m and if you want to know more, uh, there is a very uh, thick document by IEA. It's on the guidelines for setting up the psychotron facilities. And inside this document, there is a table that lists out all the costs needed to set up a psychotron facilities. So basically, to set up a psychotron facilities, uh, money is the first issue to consider. <laughs> okay, And how much is the cost? Based on the estimation, is about uh, US dollars, 500,000 to 600,000 per year. This is per year. Okay, and the psychotron facilities, uh, previously, the psychotrons are installed inside a bunker that need a very heavy shielding of the buildings, but the modern psychotrons are available now. The modern psychotrons is a self-suited psychotron like this. They are smaller and they already come with the shielding. So you do need to add additional shielding to the uh, buildings, to the rooms. And the recent uh, technology, they have this one called dose on demand uh, psychotron, which uh, it, will, it can only produce one dose at one time. And also they are mini psychotron. And more recently, uh, this is by one of the manufacturers, they have a small, smaller size of psychotron, self shielded but with high energy. And it can be used to produce both foreign 18 and the carbon 11. Okay, so uh, next I would like to uh, talk a little bit about the emergency preparedness. Uh, in the past five years, IEA has actually put in a lot of efforts uh, in this so-called EPR, emergency and response plan. So they have actually done a lot of training okay, around the world. And also there's some publications, and this is a good one that we can refer. It's a pocket guide for medical physicists supporting the response to nuclear or radiological emergency. 
So inside the document, uh, there are a table here listed out what are the uh, PPE that need to be ready just for uh, emergency case. Okay, so it even uh, put in the inventory here, the numbers of uh, jumpsuits, how many gloves we need, and how many shoe covers we need, and so on. And this is a plan, the workflow. Uh, I'm not going to go to details. I just want to show you that uh, we need to have this form. And this emergency actually uh, include the major uh, nuclear accident. It could happens uh, outside of the hospitals. It, it could be from the industry uh, nuclear services as well. So in that kind of scenario, uh, the individuals, uh, so-called patients, they will be sent to the hospitals. So the country need to uh, identify which hospitals should be get ready for nuclear emergency. And during the emergency, uh, what should we do? So we, we should have a proper layout. Okay, when the ambulance arrive at the entrance, okay, we should actually isolate. We should actually uh, divide the area for contaminated patient as well as the clean area. So when the patient is arriving at the hospitals, we need to have a survey point. So after we survey the patients, if the patient is uh, contaminated, they have to go to the red zone. If the patient is clean from radiation, they will be sent to the clean area. Okay, uh, this and also for the emergency preparedness uh, plan, not only we need to have the documents ready to know uh, what we should do when emergency happen, we also need to have drill, some uh, practice, some training. Okay, and this one, uh, some pictures, uh, some training done in our local hospitals in Malaysia. Uh, so, and also it involved the whole team, not only medical physicists. And this is a micrograph, electron micros, micrograph of the chromosome who is being uh, destroyed by the radiation. So basically it's a fragmented chromosome here, and this is ring formation, and this is a dicentric chromosome. So this uh, shape of the chromosome, this formation of chromosome uh, represents the radiation effects. Okay, and the emergency plan uh, should include the responsibility of the whole team. So it is a teamwork and during the training as well, it should be done all together. It's not possible without a teamwork. Okay, uh, lastly, I just, I would like to share this one. It's very interesting. Um, document. This is from IEA also uh, for the recent pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. So pandemic, uh, even though it's not radiation related, but it's an emergency and it affects everybody, okay? Everybody, public as well as hospitals and of course the nuclear medicine department. So in case of this uh, pandemic happens, what should we do? Okay, uh, some important notes here about the COVID-19. One infected person can transmit to two to three people and the transmission can be via the droplets, meaning uh, through the coughing, speaking or the breathing. And also that recently they suspected it will be airborne as well. And asymptomatic patients can also transmit the virus. So because of the uh, very high rate of transmission is considered as a, a pandemic and hence is an emergency. These are the statistics uh, recently published uh, on the global impact of COVID-19 on nuclear medicine department. So uh, there are 72 countries involved and also, um, they did a survey, the questionnaire survey on more than 200 uh, nuclear medicine centers in the world. And it was observed that uh, most of the departments have a decrease rate of the nuclear medicine cases. This is for diagnostic nuclear medicine, uh, up to uh, like 50 to 80%. So they have cut down the patients uh, from 50 to 60%. And this is for nuclear medicine therapy. Also, it's about 50% uh, of the patients. And this is the numbers of uh, nuclear medicine staff who are 
infected with COVID-19. Uh, but in the document, it doesn't mention uh, whether the patient, the sorry, the staff is uh, infected by the patients in the nuclear medicine department or uh, from elsewhere. So it's difficult to trace. But uh, fortunately, 85% uh, are not affected. So meaning that, meaning that uh, the facilities, the nuclear medicine departments have done a good job in the handling of emergency. And also there is document if you are interested to read about nuclear medicine services after the COVID-19. How do we gear back to normal? So it has to be a very strategic planning and it has to be done face by face. Okay, so face by face meaning that uh, how, how many patients, uh, number of patients you control to come to the department. And how it affected us. So now we have a so-called new normal, new norm. And uh, these are the floor for the patients who come to the hospitals now, in, I mean today, nowadays. Uh, when the patient come to the hospital, we have implement all sorts of filtering. So first, uh, we need to monitor the temperature of the patient. And patients are required to wear masks. And we control the visitors and also the accompanying person. And also we apply a distance as well. So this is very much, very much uh, applied to our principles of radiation protections, right? Like time shielding distance. Okay, so it's very much, uh, it's a similar condition is applying here. Okay, so uh, lastly, what is the future of uh, nuclear medicine? Uh, I mentioned just now is, uh, I would foresee it will be the personalized dosimetry, treatment planning and artificial intelligence. Uh, but of course, not only that, there would be also, uh, a lot of efforts being put into biology, especially radiobiology. So how radiation interact with biology. And recently there is a very interesting talk uh, organized by the IOMP webinar uh, on the hypoxic uh, effect. So how the hypoxic effects affecting the treatment outcomes in radiotherapy. So we need a more extensive knowledge in radiobiology in order to understand the characteristics of cancers and how do we treat them. And also uh, nanomedicine is very common nowadays using nanoparticles and maybe nano nuclear medicine. Maybe there might be a new term in the future where we are using nanoparticles but labeled with uh, radiated source and we use it for diagnostic purposes. So uh, as medical physicists, we have our direct involvement here. So this is our roles, our area. Uh, whereas this might not be our area, but we should collaborate because uh, everything is hybrid nowadays and we need to apply the, the knowledge in our areas as well. So this is how I see the future. Uh, of course, uh, we are all moving together towards uh, precision medicine. Precision medicine means uh, the four P's, which is predict, personalize, preempt, and participation. So the future would be the patient come to the hospital, we collect a specimen of patients such as tissue, blood, saliva, or even the uh, CT image or radio uh, image. And based on that, we, we will run through the genomics, proteomics, uh, metabolomics, radiomics, and so on. And the new term is called panomic. <laughs> panomic is a combination of all these omics. And in the end, we need to aggregate the data and we need to use a uh, computers help uh, for big data analysis and so on. And in the end, give us the uh, good clinical outcome data. Yeah, so this is my last slide. Uh, yeah, this is my last slide. I'd like to throw back the question to all of you. Uh, is conventional nuclear medicine, or we so-called the technician 99 imaging, going to a dead end? What do you think? Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Jaya. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Jiang, for the very informative and attractive uh, talk about the nuclear medicine facilities and radiopharmaceutical. So now it is the time for the questions and answers. I, I, I got uh, three questions from the audience. So first one uh, from uh, uh, one of the participants. They are, they are, the question is, how can a nuclear physicist fits uh, in terms. I, I will share my slides. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry again, please. Uh, yeah, wait one minute. So, the how can a nuclear physicist?
fits uh, in terms of research uh, related to diagnostic uh, therapy and uh, personalized medicine especially when uh, when one uh, when one are studying under the medical doctors or radiologist so they ask about the uh, opportunity for the research and okay so the question is regarding uh, how do we get ourselves involved in research is it yes yes okay and uh <clears throat> I'm not sure the specific question. Does it mean uh, if you are in imaging, uh, diagnostic imaging department, how do you get yourself involved in radiotherapy or nuclear medicine? Do yes. I understand the questions correctly? Oh, okay. All right. So, um, yeah. So, actually, uh, multidisciplinary research is very, very much encouraged. So, we now realize we, we cannot just do research in our own area without collaborating with others. So, we, we should learn from each other's strength. So, how to get ourselves involved? Just, uh, we have to go out. <laughs> we have to go out and talk to people. Talk to our friends uh, in other departments and also talk to the clinicians to see what are the needs in the clinical. Thank you. Uh, can you uh, uh, stop your uh, screen sharing? Then I can see other questions that is easy for you. Oh, okay. So. Ah, okay. Thanks. Okay. The second question is from uh, Bang Bangladesh. Uh, yeah, this is the question. So, when the radio uh, radioactive isotope is injected into the patient body, after few minutes, the patient will uh, death due to the any reason, unknown reason. So by God grace, then how to handle or care this type of patients as a nuclear medicine technologist or radio radiological technology physicist? So how, uh, how to handle these uh, situations? Okay, so actually this is considered one of the emergency. It has to be included in the emergency plan during the planning of the nuclear medicine facilities. So uh, that we have to have a very proper step-by-step -step guidelines, like what should we do when the patient died in the nuclear medicine department. Okay, so first of all, of course, uh, the first thing first is to inform the RPO, Radiation Protection Officer. And most of the time, the medical physicists, clinical medical physicists who work in the hospital, they also act as a RPO. So the RPO need to have a very clear uh, mind of how to handle the situations. So uh, they need to bring along the survey meters. Okay, uh, first to make sure the, the scene is uh, clear from any contamination or the high radiation exposure. And then uh, further investigation can be carried out. Okay, the third one. So, the, please explain how are the uh, regulations in the in your country regarding the previous uh, provisions of for the uh, release and discharge discharge of nuclear medicine patients. Okay, uh, in Malaysia, in my country, we have a very very clear uh, flaw. So, uh, for patients who are above, uh, who are injected above thousand and hundred megabacteria of iodine one three one. It is a requirement, okay, requirement to what to admit the patient in the isolation ward. And after maybe two or three days, the medical physicist will go to the isolation ward, okay, and bring along the survey meters and they will measure the radiation exposures at one meter away from the patient. So if the radiation uh, level fall below, can't remember the exact number now, uh, certain limit, the dose rate limit, then the patient can be discharged. If not, the patient has to be continued to stay in the hospitals until the external radiation exposure uh, is below the limit. So I think the last question is from uh, some other person. So please, can you give specific research ideas why collaborating uh, with radiochemists? Why is it? Why or yes. how? Why? Why? How I think uh, how collaborating <laughs> with radio chemistry? Yes. Okay. Uh, why then is very clear answer because we need to integrate our knowledge together because uh, for even for radiation 
treatment. We need to have knowledge in uh, biology, physics, as well as chemistry. Chemistry because it's related to the uh, radioactive source or radio pharmaceuticals. So that is why we need to collaborate with them so that we can each of party can actually contribute the knowledge together. And how to do that? Uh, as I say, we need to go out, we need to talk to them, we need to talk to our core colleagues in different areas to understand each other uh, needs and the strengths. Yeah, so I finally, hope I answered. Yeah, just, uh, finally, I have a question. Now the technologies they improve day, day to day. So what about the technology versus the dose, patient dose? It's increase or decrease? Patient dose, is it? Uh, you mean for the imaging or therapy? Yeah. Imaging, imaging. Imaging. Imaging, of course, we can see the dose is gradually decrease. Gradually. Uh -huh. Yeah. So with the technology. T yeah. Uh, two reasons. One is because of the technology. Technology is the main reason, actually, because of the improvement of the detectors. And nowadays, we have digital semiconductor detectors, which can uh, more efficiently, it can convert the radiation into the signals. That is the first one. And the second one is also because of all the training, as well as the optimization approach that uh, us, medical physicists, together with our colleagues are doing. Okay, okay, thank you very much uh, again, uh, the Professor Jiang, again. So the event was very successful. So I think we got uh, about 100 participants. So finally, I would like to thank uh, again, AFM uh, for giving me this opportunity. So now I hand over this session to the Professor Anand Chokle uh, to conclude the event. So thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much. Just I'm seeing uh, Professor Jin Xian's is there, who is the ETC chair. So he will uh, conclude and uh, give further information. It is over to Professor Jin Chiyans. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, both. Thank you, Professor Yang. Thank you, Professor Jama. Uh, for the last talk, uh, nuclear medicine has been uh, incredibly important role in the modern medical field, the medical uh, medicine field. So today, Dr. Yang, uh, was a very informative and very useful uh, lecture. And, uh, I think it's you no. Know, also, it's very. Uh, we have a very good uh, discussion about the questions asked by the audience. And answer. Now we are uh, go to the end. So I would like to say the next. Uh, I just want to back to the the next webinar will come uh, on November fifth. It's Professor Alan Kugler. He's going to give us a talk on the dose reference level. So we are... Any more questions, Dr... I think Dr. Huang is hands rising. Is there any questions, Dr. Huang? Otherwise, we will close this seminar. Okay, I think... Uh, no more questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you all. Hope to see you next month, okay. November 5th. And uh, for the Dr. Anand, she will give us another talk. Okay, bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you everyone. Stay safe. Stay safe. Bye.